Did you know Variety, the children's charity, is the entertainment charity started by a group of show business people who found an abandoned baby in a theatre way back in 1928. These kind-hearted performers raised so much money to help the lost child that they began helping other children. And Variety, the children's charity, was born. Read the full story and support the entertainer's charity that supports kids in need today. Visit variety.org.au. You're listening to the School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast with me, Maury Morgan. Ladies and gentlemen, your next comedian. <laughs> Shouldn't drink on an empty head, you know that, don't you? That is the shittiest I've ever heard in my life. Everyone in this room is now dumb for having no. listened to it. That's a bucket list. <laughs> you have dangerously underprepared yourself for the shit that is about to get real. Not many comedians can claim the sheer speed of success that Jack Levi, a.k.a. Elliot Goblet, has enjoyed. Spotted by talent scouts only 10 months into his career, Jack's round glasses wearing character quickly became a regular face on Australian TV, namely Hey Hey It's Saturday, The Big Gig and The Midday Show. His character's catatonic, monotonal one-liners also quickly became recited across Australian workplaces and schools, making his look and sound embedded in Australian comedy history. In this School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast episode, Jack Levi talks about being discovered, Daryl Summers, writing material and his move into keynote speaking and emceeing events. And don't worry, I'm talking to Jack, not Elliot, so the interview is upbeat and exciting. So, ladies and gentlemen, the man behind Elliot Goblet, Mr. Jack Levi. Good morning, Jack. Jack Levi, how are you, mate? Very well, Maury, and as Elliot Goblet would say, it's great to be inside your podcast. Oh, very good, very good. You, he has aged well, uh, the Elliot. He, he's up with the modern times now with podcasts. There was no podcast way back, was there, in the 80s when you when you kicked off your career as Elliot Goblet? No podcast at all, mate. No, no, we're very different times in the 80s and not what they are now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, for those listening to this podcast, um, might be a little bit confused confused because we're going to be talking about a person in third person, that is Elliot Goblet. Some people might not even know, Jack, that Elliot Goblet isn't actually a real person. It's it's a it's a character that you created. Oh yeah, exactly. Uh, just so happens that Jack Levi and Elliot Goblet are co-tenants in the same body. So <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So yes, <laughs> Elliot Goblet's the character that I created. Exactly. That's right. And and the the Jack Levi has a bit of a well, I won't say boring past, but um, did he work at well? Did he? Sorry, did you? Did you start off your career as as an analyst at Telecom? Yeah, actually, a, a, sh- a short burst at an insurance company first, mm-hmm. and then uh, then thirteen years at Telecom, exactly. Um, but there was overlap. There was a six year period of overlap between uh, my working at Telecom and my first six years in my comedy career. So oh, right. six year overlap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's. I think that's probably normal for most comedians. You don't just become an over overnight success, is it? It's a ten year or six year in your case road to overnight success. Well, a bit different in my case. I was actually uh, I was very lucky, I've got to say, um, because ten months after I started doing stand up comedy, mm-hmm. which was mid nineteen eighty one. Yeah, uh, I got a spot on a. A talent show called You're a Star, and mm-hmm. that's when the Daryl Summers team discovered me. Oh. Uh, so it was ten months after I started in comedy, I was discovered by Daryl Summers, and he was putting he used me on his Tuesday night program. Um, he had a variety show on Tuesday night for two years, yep. 1982 and 1983, yep. and used me as a semi regular. So I was lucky. Yeah. Oh, that's that's perfect. And at the time, you're thinking telecom, telecommunications, computers. Ah, oh, they're not going to go anywhere. Comedy. That's where I want to be. Well, actually, the balance worked for me really well. Uh, you know, being a computer analyst and then a marketing analyst by day, and uh, doing comedy by night. That balance yep. worked perfectly for me. But when the hobby, which was comedy, started started paying me more than my day job, I thought it was time to then leave the day job and make the hobby. A full-time career, which is what I did in 1987, yeah. Ah. When you got discovered by Daryl Summers and the team, were you Jack Levi or were you Elliot Goblet already? Oh, Elliot Goblet already, yeah. And Elliot's your middle name, my understanding. 
Elliot is my middle name, mm. yeah, and Goblin. Where's that from? I dreamt up in a in a brainstorming session with myself. I came up with <laughs> Goblin. Yeah. Um, I ran the name across a few people. They laughed, and I thought, well, if people are laughing at the name I've come up with. Yeah. It's a good one to use for a comedy character. Yeah, it's got Gob in it. It's got a, you know, it's mouth, doesn't it? So, yeah, no, look, it's perfect. It's aged well. Good. So t- you're saying 10 months in, we've kind of jumped ahead really quickly there. 10 months in, 10 months in, you go from, well, essentially, did you even have an open mic experience? Did you ever get up there and try out night, as, as it would have been called back in the 80s? Absolutely. It a joke, which was uh, a venue above the last yep. laugh, so in the same building. Uh, mm-hmm. I started mid-1981 on a tryout night, and that same night was the first night for other comedians, uh, namely Trevor Marmite and mm-hmm. Anthony Morgan. Oh, we all go. started on that same night doing a tryout night, and I did 16 tryout nights up there before yep. I got a paid gig. Yep. And uh, there's a few comedians out there that have got their either their first $20 or whatever it was at the time. Do you keep that rare $20 bill or $50 bill or whatever it was? Yeah, I do, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. And it's worth, what, $20, $21 now, $22? Oh, or... I don't know, but uh, it was just great getting paid for something you love doing. It was wonderful, and it was $20, you're right. It yeah. was, yeah. No, sadly, I don't think much has changed for those starting out in the business. Um, I, I guess back then, if, if I can be, my, from my understanding, is there wasn't as much competition, perhaps, in the scene as there is today, there's a lot more comedians doing open mics, so maybe that's driven the price down. Supply demand. Yeah. You'd know that. You're an analyst, right? Absolutely, mate. There are so many comedians trying to uh, to get you know get their career up, and um, a, lot, a, lot, a lot fail, and uh, a number of them get through, and some of them that get through are really good, and others that get through, in my opinion, Pretty mediocre. So we've got, we've certainly got a lot of comedians out there. Yes, mm, it's almost like mm. politics. Deadpan delivery. Now, yeah. again, was was Elliot Goblet from day one this deadpan looking at the camera delivery? Yeah. Or was there another character? No, I, I uh, actually, it wasn't so deadpan when I started, but when I developed, um, when I developed for television, I, after I did my You're a Star appearance. Mm-hmm. Then I then I came up with a very deadpan version of Elliot Goblet. And so when I did my first Daryl Summers Tonight Show, we, uh, the audience were greeted with uh, almost catatonic uh, <laughs> Elliot Goblet, uh, not a flicker, zinc cream nose, uh, just stared straight down the camera. So very, very deadpan when I started on Daryl Summers' show back in 1982. And I heard that zinc, that zinc on the nose actually was a response to a, a judge that had made a comment some time earlier. Is that right? Yeah, well, I, I've got to say uh, your research is very good, Mori. <laughs> I, um, yeah, when I was being judged on You're a Star, yeah. I threw a, uh, a red nose on while I was being judged and I just maintained a very deadpan uh, look, yeah, and that that uh, I guess that um, contradiction of me standing there deadpan with a red nose on gave me the inspiration to go very deadpan with something else on my nose, and that happened to be zinc cream. So yeah. yes, perfect timing. Exactly. And, and for those that are the millennials listening to this who have no idea what zinc cream is, it's sunscreen, right? It protects coloured sunscreen. And it was white, was it? Did you go for different colours on different... Yeah. It was white, yeah. It was white and uh, I guess the incongruity really worked for me. Here I was inside doing stand-up comedy with something on my nose that you'd, you know, you'd associate with somebody on the beach. Yep. So the incongruity worked very well and the little round glasses and the, yep. the catatonic stare, it all worked and I was lucky that it all worked. Yeah, that's great. Well, on that note, have you ever cracked? So is that catatonic staring ever broken and you have just couldn't help yourself and smiled or laughed or, or worse? Yeah, well, these days I'm a, a lot less deadpan, so I actually do smile occasionally or smirk. Um, yeah, yeah. And if I happen to laugh because something really funny has happened, you know, some interjector might come up with a zinger. Yeah. And if I do happen to laugh, and I get a round of applause. So I'm in a no-lose situation, yeah. really. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, and, and back in the back in the days where you ha- where you're on TV, did you ever lose it? Did you ever did you have a comeback? So uh, yeah, well, well, on TV, of course, you don't get heckless, but occasionally, no. I would I would uh, put a bit of smiling in the eyes, and I think the audience felt that I was on the verge of maybe losing it, and that excited them. You know, so me just smiling in the eyes uh, and looking like I'm possibly going to lose it got the audience. Uh, to a point where sometimes I get a round of applause for that, so it was pretty easy. Yeah, right. Yeah. John Blackman didn't try. John Blackman was the voiceover. Uh, you'd hear him, you'd never see him on Hey Hey Saturday. He never tried to trick you up or trip you over. No, no, no. That would be reserved for red faces acts. But yeah. I was a professional yeah. act, so he would never interrupt me. Excellent. He would just laugh, and maybe at the end of the end of my spot, he'd say something like that, uh, very funny Elliot or something like that. So oh, he was good. very, very supportive, John Black. Oh, that's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, today, people, some some people may remember you as the Elliot Goblet from the Hey Hey It's Saturday and other, other comedy shows that you've done. Yeah. Some people might know you today as the MC and the, the speaker and the wedding speaker as well. I, I know you MC and host weddings as well. Where does your content come from today? Because obviously you're the Jack Levi and the Elliot Goblet is matured. You've probably got a lot of content behind you, but you've also got to be relevant. Yeah, well, look, um, it's always Elliot Goblet on stage. Yep. Uh, sometimes I MC, sometimes I do a comedy spot. Right. Uh, but it's always funny and it's always Elliot. Um, yes, you're right. I do corporate, I do weddings, I do birthday parties. Whenever I do those events, I write special material for the event, and mm-hmm. that is easy for me to do because I've got issues and frustrations and people idiosyncrasies that I can work on. So yep. that's easy. Um, I don't write as many of my general one-liners like I used to yep. because before I had an incentive. You know, I needed to write 20 new one-liners so I could get on to Hey Hey it's Saturday or Big Gig or Midday Show or whatever. Yep. But these days, it's I, I, I write very few of those general one-liners I've got plenty of them, so yeah. plenty to use, but very few new ones. But writing mainly special material for these events that I do, that's where I write 99% of my material these days is special material. Special. And do you have a way of doing it? So do you, do you walk the dog, walk along the beach, drink a beer? I don't know. Is there a technique to writing comedy from scratch? Yeah, I can't write it just sitting at home at a desk or a table. I can't do that. No. I, I need to be either walking and you know along the beach or in the uh, in the bush, or sitting at a restaurant uh, with a nice view and being served. I find that gets me uh, writing my best material. Yeah, right. Excellent, mm. excellent. And in terms of the actual joke structure, do you have a format that you know? So some people talk about normal, normal twist. To, there's a different. There's different techniques. Oh, look, I've got a lot of templates, joke templates, and certainly with my special material, you know, I've got I've got jokes to cover every possible frustration that a that a company might have, and I've got jokes to cover every possible idiosyncrasy that a person might have. You know, right. for example. If person is vain i've got a joke for a vain person if a person is is deadpan i've got the joke for a deadpan person if a person's always on the mobile phone i've got a joke to cover that so yeah i've really covered it all uh, with much many years of experience i've got to that point yeah right and is this in a do you, being an analyst coming from uh the days of uh, telecom do, is this all in a spreadsheet excel form documented away or are you a paper man you Write it down. I'm a paper man, mate. I write it down. Yeah. In fact, I still use a, a paper diary. You know, one page per day. I yeah. don't. Uh, I, I'm more comfortable doing that. I've got to say. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's fine. Makes sense. Mm. So, what advice would you have for those entering the market? Sort of the the Elliot goblets of the 1980s, but today, sort of entering the market of stand up comedy. Yeah. Well, um, I think there's a number of things, but uh, if they can get an individual style or an individual point of view, it, it helps, you know, not just be a copy of everybody else. Mm-hmm. There's enough of those copies of everybody else out there. Um, resilience, that's needed because you're going to have bad nights in amongst the good ones, so you've got to be able to pick yourself up. Yeah. And that belief in yourself, which keeps you going. Uh, you're also, being supportive of others, that's important. It shouldn't just be about them. No. You've got to, uh, you know, give advice to other younger comedians or uh, take advice 
from all the wiser ones, perhaps, um, mm-hmm. and have their off-stage act together. That's what they need to do. If they, you know, if they, if they're heavy into booze or drugs, they need to clean that up and just focus on getting the job done, the stand-up comedy, and um, yeah, just get their off, get, be happy off stage. Yeah. Otherwise, they might be angry people who um, become aggressive mm-hmm. on stage, and that's not really healthy. You got to, you got to. Have an edge. I agree that you have to have an edge in your comedy, but an edge mm-hmm. with a sense of humour. You know, I mean, Tom Gleeson's fantastic. He he in hard chat on Channel Two. Yeah. In he, uh, you know, he's he can be um, a bit harsh, but he does it with humour, with a smirk. Yes. So that's just fantastic. He's got the balance beautifully. Right. Is he like that off stage, mm. or is he a nicer guy? Yeah, oh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very nice guy. Yeah, Tom Gleeson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's look. He's he's done his apprenticeship, and he's got to where he's got over time, and he's got a good team behind him. And um, oh, I reckon he's uh, he's doing it really well, Tom Gleeson. Really well. Uh, your money, your money's on Tom. Oh, good. Yeah. Right, well. Uh... We'll reach out and see if he, we can get his take. Yeah, well, I reckon if we, we sadly and badly need a variety show in Australia, and I think he'd be a good host of a variety show. Uh, bring back Hey Hey? No. no, not bring back Hey Hey, but have a, <laughs> a new variety show, you know, a fresh one with a guy like Tom Gleeson hosting it. Yep. Well, there you go. You heard it yep. first here on the School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast. We'll see if that happens. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well. Uh, today, as I mentioned, you're a you're a corporate entertainer. You're an MC. How how does that differ from the audiences at a comedy club? So, and I know you 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 still put your put your name in and and get up on stage occasionally. Um, I was talking to Dave Ivkovic, who yep. has yep. performed with you, I think, at the Comics Lounge. Yes, I do perform. Uh... Uh, publicly, not often, but for example, uh, I've got a job coming up that's a dinner sh- and show, and they've got two comedians on the bill. Yep. One comes on after entree, and the other one comes on after main course, and the other comedian, Trevor Marmalade. There you go. So I'm looking forward to working with him. He's a very funny guy that hasn't been doing a lot of work in recent times, but he was huge when he was on the footy show yes. on the bar. Yes, he regular, was. On the other yeah. Footy show, yes. And very witty, very so, witty man. Yeah, yeah. Is that difficult in an in an audience where you don't know what's going to happen? No. This, versus, I say, a wedding that's a bit more formal? Well, this dinner and show is open to the public, so they're there to see comedy. Mm. With a wedding or a corporate event, they're not there to see comedy. They're there for other reasons, so yeah. you've really got to get them. Um, you know, really got to get them to look around and focus on you because you're uh, you're not really what they've come to see, you know. They've no. come to a wedding for the wedding couple, or they've gone to a corporate event because it's a it's a conference or it's a uh, a dinner after the or the uh, free uh, booze. Yeah, well, that's right. And you know they're on round tables, and you've really got to make sure that they turn around and yeah. focus on you. And that only works if you're relevant and funny. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, great. Well, on that note, if yeah. someone does want to get in contact, uh, either well, do they get in contact with Jack Jack Levi, or they get in contact with Elliot Goblet? Uh, they get in, in contact with Jack Levi. Yeah, um, but you go through the Elliot Goblet website, which I've got in front of me. Ah, uh, if you want that. Yeah, tell us what that is, and so people listening to this know. Yeah. Okay, it's www.elliotgoblet.com. Dot .au okay and it's e w l l i o t g o b l e t often misspelled but that's the correct spelling um, if they go through that and go through the contact page they can fill in a few details and email me and I'll come back to them as jack and I'll talk sense to them and and uh, yeah we, we we can work things out correctly very good so aside from that comedy night with Trevor Marmalade have you got any any private events coming up any weddings uh, any any shows that you need to prepare for, write new jokes for? Oh, yeah, all the time. I have got a, 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 a very di- a different show in, in Victoria, um, and that's uh, it's a Born in the 80s show where um, I work with a band. They're an 80s band, and I come out and mm-hmm. uh, dress in 80s gear and uh, talk about the 80s. That's the front part of my act. Yep. And the latter part of my act is just is one-liners from my act. So you've got... Uh, about a 10-minute segment of me talking about the 80s. So that's fresh material. And that's on Safety Beach, Safety Beach, the atrium at Safety Beach on 28 October. 
Mm, that good. Then, apart from that, I've got weddings and corporate events as well, but people can't come to those. No, well, wedding crashes, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. mm, excellent. Well, Jack and Elliot, thank you very much for your time and sharing some insights there and uh, how you got started back in, uh, I like how you very specifically said uh, the middle part of the of 1981, not the middle of the 80s, but 81, <laughs> very <laughs> memorable moment for you there yeah. um, and and some some of the luck that you had 10, 10 months in and you get picked up by Daryl Summers who uh, who obviously is a great chaperone for a comedy career um, in the 80s yeah. and, and early 90s right up till 1999 hey hey Rand. so I was very lucky that Daryl picked me up uh, the other guy that got picked up from the same talent show was ostentatious he was picked up by Don Lane Mm. Don Lane only ran for a couple yeah, of years, yeah. whereas Daryl run ran from you know for me eighteen years I had with Daryl, so very supportive to me. I'm lucky that he picked me up uh, as his kind of new comedian to run with. Yeah, oh, very lucky today. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I don't know where Daryl Summers is today. Um, be good to get him on the podcast. He's a bit reclusive, unless you know otherwise. He is. A, he is a bit. Yes. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Jack, thanks very much. Say a big thank you to Elliot uh, for both your time. It's been very valuable. And I grew up with you on TV. I think we did, like the movie The Castle, watch Hey Hey It's Saturday over a meal um, every every Saturday. So thank you for being part of my Saturdays. You're welcome, mate. Great talking to you, Maury. Welcome. Thanks, Jack. 